Hello everyone, uh, my name is Laura Shipp, I'm a PhD student at Royal Holloway University of London um, and today I'm going to be presenting some work that I did with my supervisor Jorge Blasco and both of us will be here today to answer any questions you might have about the research. Uh, so with this presentation we're hoping also to encourage new research in this area in future. So what are menstrual apps? Um, well, they're a way of digitally tracking your period for all kinds of uh, purposes. Um, they've become a really important tool for a lot of menstruators um, and they're helpful because of the kind of range of things that they can capture from things like your uh, kind of general health tracking from your water intake to the amount of sleep you're getting uh, to uh, your sex life and some of the moods and symptoms you might be experiencing through your period um, and you can see that uh, one example of that on the left um, but they also can ask you uh, what what you're using the app for are you trying to avoid pregnancy uh, are you trying to um, get pregnant uh, which you can see from the middle uh, picture uh, and they might help you work out when your next period will be um, or your chance of getting pregnant uh, as you can see on the on the right but why are they interesting from a privacy point of view well, they collect this unique combination of information, so things to do with health, alongside PII, so anything to do with email addresses, location, um, sometimes they ask if you're in a relationship and so on, and then your fertility and cycle information, alongside your sexual activity, and they also have this, this inf information about why you're using the app, so like, are you trying to get pregnant, um, and kind of from that can infer where you are in your kind of life stage or where you choose to be in your life. Um, but also this is a really big industry. So uh, Femtech as a whole is predicted to be worth uh, 50 billion US dollars by 2025. So not that long away. So you can see that in terms of revenue, this is also a really big area. Um, and Menstrual apps have huge numbers of users. Uh, this app on the left, which you can see the logo of, has 100 billion users alone. So if we think about um, the scale of this issue, it's reaching, any, any kind of privacy issues are reaching a really big audience. It's also worth saying though that these are things that, these are apps that are hugely changing people's lives and practices. Um, so for example, Natural Cycles, which is uh, now an FDA approved digital contraceptive, is something that people are literally using as their contraceptive method. Um, so they're kind of the impact that they're having on people's lives is also very dramatic. But menstruators are really reliant on these, these apps. They're indispensable in terms of uh, helping predict uh, periods for kind of, um, you know, just it's useful to know where they are, but also they can be used in terms of diagnosing disorders. Um, so it's not so much looking for people to stop using these apps, but improving what is available. So what research has been done in this area so far? Uh, well, most of it has been done by uh, different rights groups, including kind of reproductive rights groups and privacy rights groups. Um, and they've looked at a variety of different things um, within these apps. Um, so on the left, the, this report uh, based basically on looking into the developers of these apps, their business models, um, and the way they talk about privacy to their users. Um, but the middle report was more looking at things like for technical privacy and security flaws. So these are two quite different um, reports um, and neither of them looked at the same apps. And then on the right, we can see some examples of kind of investigative journalism in this area. Um, and these two uh, news pieces looked at where a Facebook SDK, which was embedded in a variety of different period tracking apps, meant that that those apps were sharing information with Facebook without telling their users that they were doing so. So all of these app, all of these reports found that apps had a variety of privacy and security issues, but this hasn't been something that's been picked up largely in academia. But there are lots of useful papers um, that we use to kind of understand these apps um, from past research. In particular, health apps provided quite a good proxy for um, kind of understanding the risks attached to uh, uh, kind of issues in privacy issues in menstrual apps, um, but also 
uh, work done on mobile apps and uh, privacy policies has been really helpful for developing this research further. We've landed on three different research questions, each kind of looking at something different in terms of the privacy practices of the apps. The first question, um, how well do developers inform their inform menstrual app users about their privacy practices within their policies and privacy and communications. This was really looking at um, the quality inf inf of information given to the user um, and how, uh, yeah, how well that was brought across. Um, because it's no point, there's no kind of point providing information if it's not um, given in a way that the user can understand. And that led us on to the second question, is, this, is the information they provide clear and understandable? And this was really looking at the accessibility of the language they use to provide this information. Um, so one's about quality and one's about language. And the third question, comparing uh, do apps behave differently in reality in comparison to what is stated in their policy? This is really looking at whether there was anything uh, lurking in the app behaviour that wasn't being stated in the policy. And these research questions translated into methods. It's worth saying that we used a mixed method approach, which was partly automatically executed and partly manually executed. Um, so starting with uh, research, researching the developers. With this, we really wanted to understand who the developers were, why they were, were developing these apps, what other services and products did they uh, provide, because yeah, this was to really get a sense of, of um, who was behind the apps and what their motivation might be. The second method, uh, looking at the policy availability and other kind of communications with the user, this was looking at just whether the, the privacy policy was easy to find and um, was other information given to the user about privacy. The third point, policy content and analysis, policy content analysis this was looking at, okay, so we found we found the privacy policy. What is the scope of that policy? Is it clear that it relates to the app that we've downloaded? Um, what purpose do they give for any data collection? And do they provide good information to the user about their rights and how to execute them with this particular developer? The second research question about language was answered with this language analysis method. Uh, so this had several parts. Um, firstly, we looked at uh, the length and the level of detail that the policy goes into. We then looked at and assessed the ease of kind of the readability of the um, policy uh, using the Flesh Reading E score um, and scored each policy. And we also looked at the clarity of language used within the uh, policy. So whether there could be any uh, language or words that made the meaning of that policy unclear. For example, um, the word may or might, which adds uh, kind of uh, unpredictability to what's happening um, to the user data. And the final research question was answered with this last uh, method where we did a various kind of various comparisons between what was stated in the policy and uh, the real life behaviors of the apps. So on the one hand we looked at the data entered into the app or what could be entered into the app and what was stated in the privacy policy. We also looked at the third parties that were in the policy in comparison to the libraries that were embedded in the app code using LibScout. And we also looked at what the policy said it uh, collected from the from the uh, users and compared that to the network traffic analysis that we executed. So um, now to go on to some results. We, we had uh, 30 apps that we looked at. Um, we, we picked the apps based on the most downloads that they had. Um, and 30 was the kind of limit of our study, but we did include two paid apps on top of that. Um, overall, that accounted for 178 million downloads based on Google Play uh, download numbers alone. So that in reality is likely to be many more downloads than it looks from this number alone. But now to go over some more things that we found. Starting with a kind of general overview of, of this picture, we found that four apps had no privacy policies at all, which uh, 
On the on the one hand, is a relatively small number, but if we consider the number of downloads that that covers, it's at least one eleven point five million. Um, so this is a huge number of people that are impacted by um, this no policy and uh, a, a huge number of people that don't have any information about what's happening to their data. We found that 70 policies uh, were available both in the app and in the Play Store, which is again a good a kind of good number, um, meaning that not that many found it uh, would find it that hard to, to locate a policy but obviously there is still room for improvement here. In terms of the scope of the policies we did find only eight policies were directly relevant to the app making it quite confusing uh, if you're finding a policy to work out whether what is stated in there relates to you as a user. We also found that all apps collected data for some purpose but on the whole in comparison to other uh, the kind of general app ecosystem, this is above average um, in terms of availability of policies and such. A kind of key trend that we found, however, was that there were two broad groups of app developers producing these apps. On the one hand, we had those kind of, uh, we had the, the more traditional femtech companies that uh, provided women's digital health, had a women's digital health focus and provided similar services like fertility assistance. Um, or content around this area and, um, and, and an example of that you can see on the left and we can compare that to the kind of generic app companies that are looking for just a new kind of market to break into um, and so jumping on the period bandwagon um, and an example of that is this company on the right who uh, you can see prov provide a period tracker but also prov make these quite creepy uh, social media apps but along with many other researchers, we also found that period um, that privacy policies uh, within period trackers weren't a very good way of communicating privacy information to their users. Um, so here you can see the example, uh, the results of our language analysis in terms of the percentage of obfuscating words we found in each policy and the flesh reading ease score. Overall, we found that um, no policy really hit that happy medium between providing good quality of information to the user and um, making a policy that was easy to read. So to go into some examples here, this app, number two, which was um, a femtech app, does quite well in terms of providing a, a kind of easy policy to read, although it's obviously not perfect. A kind of bad example, but not, not terrible, um, is number 30, which is a generic app company. Um, they have a good reading e-score, but it's worth saying this is a policy that has like half a page of information, so it's really short. And yet it still has quite a hard, la large number of obfuscating words um, that, or percentage of obfuscating words that fit its um, policy. And kind of the worst end of the spectrum is this app, uh, 23, which as you can see, has a low reading e score but a, and a high number of obfuscating words. So kind of worst of both, both worlds. And now moving on to some examples of this obfuscation that we're talking about. In particular, we saw the word may feature a lot um, in terms of making the meaning of, of sentences unclear. So this is an example. We may share certain personal data um, or we may share only location and other automatic collected device information. And both of these make the meaning of that sentence really unclear, like, is this happening or is it not? But then on the other hand, we see examples of may being used like this. Because our services get more fine-tuned and better with data, you may choose to tell us more about yourself to experience these benefits, including adding a photo or uh, of yourself to your home screen. In this case, may is being used to invite the user to provide more information than it appears necessary for the functionality of the app. So may can have kind of many different uh, uses in this in the privacy policies, but all of which are kind of fairly um, nefarious. But now to move on to the way that um, data is handled within the app and within the policy thinking about the fact that this, you know, apps might be inviting users to provide more than is necessary. We can see in this graph that there is a kind of various different data points that is possible to be entered into the apps. Um, and that this varies greatly across the different apps. 
Um, so 26 collects very little uh, compar compared to 2 and 3, which collect a lot. But what this graph shows best is the fact that the number of data points mentioned within the app is almost always lower than the data that can be collected. And where we saw the biggest oversight in this area was um, in, peer in terms of period data. We found that 28 apps needed period data of some kind to set up the apps. That might be the dates of your last period, for example. And 14 of those sent, app, uh, sent that data to app servers. But only six explicitly mentioned period data within their policies. Um, again, the femtech companies tended to be better at this and providing this information. So uh, this femtech company, 13, provided uh, all of them, all of the data it collected, um, I mentioned that within the policy. Um, whereas comparison to App Eight, they didn't mention any kind of data within their as as being collected within their privacy policy. Um, but obviously, that data could be entered into the app. As we saw in this case, some of the fintech companies uh, did better at providing this information to users. On the other hand, they were the most likely, more likely to ask the user to overshare um, information in comparison to the generic app companies. Um, so these are three examples of uh, places in uh, three different apps where the user was asked for more information. On the left, you can see an example from Ovia in which the community profile of questions, ask the user to provide information like, do you have children? Have you had a miscarriage? Other questions were things like, have you had a, do you have a history of depression? Um, and in each case, this was um, asking the user to provide more and more information about themselves. In the middle, you can see an example from uh, the, the app Eve, which um, asks the user to fill out uh, a question, um, a, a quiz about UTIs and obviously is, is capturing information as a part of this. And in the final example, you can see a, a, a screenshot from the app Flow, which invites the user to say anything they, share anything they want in this community space because there are lots of other wi women here willing to share their life stories. Um, but in each of these uh, privacy policies, we see things like this. We will not delete the posts or comments you've written and shared publicly, including on the so on social media and in our community or chat features. And each of these uh, screenshots comes from these community features within the app. So this is quite a worrying trend that we're seeing where apps are asking users for more information, but there is no way of that user to, to, to claim that information and delete it if they would like to. Um, and finally, we found that uh, 29 of the 30 apps had at least one third party embedded within it, but uh, and most of those were either Google AdMob or Facebook. The most important takeaway from this is that eight policies didn't make any mention of user data being shared, and nine did not say anything specific about um, third parties being involved, so like naming third parties. But it's important also to think about the possible consequences of these apps and the data it collects um, and the possible futures it could bring about. There are big risks attached to this data that we don't see uh, in other kinds of health apps. And if these are this, this data is misused or acquired by the wrong groups, there could be big consequences. It's hard to understand uh, what those might be at the moment, but these are two examples of the ways that um, period data was used to push agendas or curtail rights. So to conclude, first of all, with this first question about quality of information, we found that overall this tended to be dependent on the developer and their interests. And we found that the level of information given to the user related to these two different groups. Femtech companies tended to be better at, at providing information to users, but often this could come with trade-offs. Um, but we found that generally apps tended to, uh, and their policies tended to be quite bad at uh, explaining the uh, extra sensitivity of period data um, with many app companies treating it just as another data point. With this second question about um, the quality, the um, clarity of information provided, uh, we found that no app and their policy really got the happy medium between 
providing the detail the user needed and the access and providing that in an accessible and clear way. And finally, with the third question, we found that third parties were the best example of where um, users weren't really told what was going on uh, with how whether um, third parties were collecting their data or not, and they were rarely mentioned within their policies. And the kind of key takeaway within this is that menstrual apps are unique in the data they collect, but the consequences of misuse of this data could be intense and severe. Um, so again, they, they are uh, an area that requires more insight and uh, research in future. Thank you very much for listening.